May the people of God say amen and amen. And I would be remiss if I did not say happy 2021. Thank God for, as we normally say, I thank God for him allowing me to see another morning. But this morning we can all say we thank God for him allowing us to see another year. Amen. Um, during uh, the 1960s, following the Second World War, there came a period of time of relationships between uh, the United States and what was then the Soviet Union and democratic nations and communist nations in which there were, uh, was an ongoing um, exchange of espionage and, and desires for one nation to know what the other was doing. And historically, this was known as the Cold War. And members who participated in that period in history were referred to as Cold Warriors. But I'm blessed this morning that as we know, it's just a tad chilly outside, but by no means has it stopped our music ministry, our media ministry, and all of our devoted servants of the Lord here within Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood from being here and prepared to serve. So I want to thank God for the cold warriors who are here this morning. I thank God for you. God bless you. God bless you. I found myself um, feeling a bit nostalgic this morning. Um, two years ago this week, I was interviewing uh, for what was then the pastoral vacancy for leadership of this great congregation. And so I was laughing at the weather this morning. It's really not that cold. There's some snow and ice, but I don't know if anyone recalls. I certainly do. The polar vortex began the night that I arrived. And so I made it a point to drive around in the vortex without my GPS. So that way, in the event that the Lord saw fit to call me to Glenwood, I would already be prepared. I, I like to be as prepared as possible for what I will be facing. So I drove around and the vortex, and the night before my first interview, I made it a point to make sure that I could find 801 East Glenwood Dyer Road in the snow without my GPS. So I was on Torrance, and I drove down Torrance and said, I'm not using my GPS, I'm just gonna try to figure this out. And I said, because should the Lord mean for me to be here, GPS or no GPS, polar vortex or no polar, polar vortex, snow or no snow, ice or no ice. I said, if I can sit in Lambeau Field for six hours and watch a football game in the snow, then it's a little thing during a vortex in order to find this great church and this great body of Christ. So I now look back two years ago and I look at this moment and I thank God for all that God has allowed us to do together as I look forward to what God will do in and through us in this coming year. And I just wanted to take an opportunity at the outset, at the beginning of this year, to thank each and every one of you, every deacon, every trustee, every ministry leader, every member of the clergy. I want to thank again our media ministry, our music ministry, our health ministry, our security ministry. I want to thank Brother Bright for all of the work that he did maintaining the building, especially during the time from March up until now. I want to thank every single member who did something, whether one thing or 10,000 things, especially during the different difficulty of this last year. You did it through tears. You did it through blood. You did it through sweat. You did it through pain. You did it through agony. You did it through mourning. You did it through bereavement. And yet God has sustained you. So I just want to thank you for allowing me to continue to stand here flat-footed and preach the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you. And again, Happy New Year to you. This morning, um, as I prepared a journey into Genesis 37 a little bit and Hoping that you'll journey with me. I just want to recognize one more member. You see, in the church, only Jesus Christ has the power to preside. Uh, that's why doctrinally I've often tried to um, communicate and educate my fellow Baptists that um, we can have leaders, we can have directors, um, but only Christ doctrinally has the power to preside. That's why the title president is reserved for Jesus. In fact, there used to be something called the Church Member's Guide published at the end of the 19th century. In the early 20th century, that would be disseminated to all the Baptist associations, and it would describe that Jesus Christ is to the church what the commander-in-chief is to the nation. This makes Christ the president of the church, and hence from there you can have chairpersons or you can have leaders or directors, but Christ is the only one with the power to preside. 
So even in a service, a minister cannot preside over service. Christ presides over the service. Ministers officiate. And the relationship of the officiant to Jesus Christ as president is similar to the relationship between the official on a football field and the commissioner of the league. Jesus would be the commissioner of the league. And the ministers officiate the doctrine and the scripture and the laws laid down and issued and decreed by the commander-in-chief and president who is our Lord and Savior. The work of the officiant is easily the most difficult work. While proclaiming the gospel is challenging, officiating weddings, officiating funerals, officiating any type of services, whether healing services or any of the ordinances within the church or morning worship is the single most difficult clerical work. It is the work of the clergy. And in fact, Jesus goes as far as to say, even the priest, that is even the clergy sin on the Sabbath because we're working. I often say there's 168 hours in a week. I work at the church. I'm called to the church. So two hours a week, I am visited at my place of work, but wherever I go, the sanctuary is with me, for it is not a mere physical thing. And the work of the officiant is a work that begins Sunday evening until the next Sunday morning. That work is so awesome, I once heard some children say that their favorite time is right after church, because it's the period at which it's the longest amount of time between they have to be back in church because it's so difficult for those one or two hours or three hours, or if you're Pentecostal, 12 hours to be in church on Sunday. And the work of the officiant is to maintain that work. So I just wanted to take an opportunity to thank our officiant and executive pastor, the Reverend Ronita A. Stubbs, for the work that she's done. May the people of God say amen for our executive pastor. Amen, God bless you. I would like to work in the book of Genesis this morning. I figure first month of the year, first Sunday of the year, we're in the season of Epiphany, the glorious appearing, and so it's fitting that we should look at the first book of the Bible, and we'll even stay in Genesis next Sunday. And so I'm in Genesis chapter 37. I'm going to read verses 12 through 24. Starting with verse 12, now his brothers had gone to graze their flocks near Shechem. And Israel, who was Jacob, said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come. I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. Verse 18. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands, saying, let's not take his life. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern, which is a pit here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him and to the cistern, that is the pit. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. If you are standing, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. This morning I want to work from the title, Get Down to Get Up. Get down to get up. Beloved, one of the most difficult things to do in this life is to avoid being put down. Whether it is being put down by words or by actions, whether it is rejection from family, friends, or foes, there are people all over this world that have resulted to doing things that they would later regret in order to avoid being put down. 
But we cannot avoid that. There's no way to avoid being put down or insulted if you're going to live in this world and walk in this life. No matter what we do, at some point, we will be put down. No matter who we are, no matter where we are, we can try to do everything in our power to avoid criticism and to avoid being insulted, to avoid being disrespected, but at some point we will be put down. It's going to happen because that's unfortunately a part of life. And we find that in this text this morning. Many of us are very familiar with this story and the story of Joseph in general. And if nothing else, many of us know that This is the story of a gifted young person who draws the envy and the ire of his own brothers. When I first arrived, now two years ago, and I began working in 1st and 2nd Samuel, first beginning with Ruth, what I stressed then and what must always be stressed when reading any part of the Bible is there is no part of the Bible disconnected from either David or Jesus. Every narrative somehow connects to either David or Jesus because both David and Jesus are in the Abrahamic line. And every scripture somehow connects to Abraham because Abraham, of course, is related to the first man, traditionally called Adam. And because the first man is just that, the first human, then his genealogy is the genealogy that leads us through all of scripture. Meaning even when we read Genesis, because Genesis was written so long after the book of Ruth and so long after the book of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, which were originally called 1 and 2 Kings, and 1 and 2 Kings was originally called 3 and 4 Kings, and even before that, 1, 2, 3, and 4 Kings was simply called the book of Kings. These books were written long before Genesis. Deuteronomy was written before Genesis. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers are canonized. They're ordered before Deuteronomy, so there is a narrative order. But these four books were written after the Babylonian exile, that is, after 516 B.C. We know this because the form of Hebrew used to compose Genesis is easily some of the most complex and complicated in all of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. It is an arrangement of highly complicated syntax, that is, sentence structure. A form of sentence structure that would not be used until the time of Ezra, Ezra being the author of Psalm 119. From this we know that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers were written at least seven, if not eight decades before Genesis, possibly even a century. That Deuteronomy, being a much simpler book, simple in its composition compared to Genesis, which uses highly layered and nuanced narrative structures, including two creation stories. Genesis has two creation stories because Ezra and the Levites, who had survived the destruction and the besieging of Israel back in 722 B.C., because these Levites were using complicated forms of a 22 consonantal Hebraic structure. Reading Genesis in English, all of this is not apparent. Reading it in Hebrew, it is immediately apparent this book was written long after Ruth. Ruth being a very short book, four chapters, very simple sentence structure, very simple storytelling. Meaning when we look at Genesis 37, it's telling two stories. It's, of course, narratively telling us the story of Joseph and his brothers. But this is actually a Davidic parallel. It is justifying how and why God tends to bless the youngest sibling in a family. It is the story of a young sibling who is working in a field, in a flock, who's the youngest of his brothers, despised by his brothers, who by way of being subjected to their taunts and to their evil results in him being elevated to a royal status. So when we finally do reach 1 Samuel, it's the story of a young child, the youngest of his siblings, working in flocks, despised by his brothers, 
who as a result of being subjected to the taunts and insults of King Saul and others, ultimately is elevated to a royal stature. It's doing two things at once, as all biblical narratives do. There's always a narrative, then there is what's called the historical or socio-historical implication. And then ultimately there's a third thing it does for Christians. Then it points towards what is called the salvific. It points towards that which is Christological or soteriological, meaning then it points from what is rooted in David towards Jesus. Meaning no matter what you read of the 748,000 some verses or 1189 chapters of the Bible in the Protestant canon, every verse, every word, every amount of punctuation is connecting Adam to Abraham to David to Jesus. Even when we look at the Lucan chronology and genealogy that connects the Levites to Jesus, by way of Mary. I want us to know this so as we journey throughout Genesis, we will not only look at the narrative of Genesis, but Genesis tells us one story while pointing to another reality. Meaning when you read two creation stories, it's just not about the merging of those stories. Those stories in particular are doing at least 14 different things. They're merging northern Israelite and southern Israelite theology. They're explaining the creation of what's called biogenesis, all living things. They are explaining the messianic genealogy. They are pointing towards even the apocalypse. There is apocalyptic references found in Genesis that make it a bookend for Revelation. Everything in the Bible is deeply connected. Nothing is isolated. So even when we read Genesis 37, in this one chapter, it's pointing towards Abraham, because it mentions Jacob, is pointing towards what would eventually be a Davidic and Messianic rise as we see how Joseph's subjection by his brothers results in his elevation. So the story is telling us that Joseph, being one of the sons of Jacob, who's called Israel at this point, is being sent on a mission by his father to go check on his brothers as they're grazing their flock. The Bible says, now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. This is adjacent to Hebron. Hebron, again, being an early Davidic reference. For David was king of Hebron before he was king of all of Judah and then Israel. The Bible says that as Jacob is speaking with the son Joseph, he tells him, I'm going to sing you to them. And Joseph says, very well. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Again, another parallel. We might recall before the fight between David and Goliath that David was sent by Jesse to go check on his brother. But Genesis 37 simply shows us that all Joseph is doing is what his father commanded him to do. All Joseph is doing is following his father's orders. He's not antagonizing his brothers. He has no evil in his heart. He did not mean his brothers harm. All he's doing is going to check on them. And the text tells us at the sight of Joseph, his brothers plotted to kill him. If all you do is follow your father's orders... If all you do is live for your father, if all you do is follow your heavenly father, there are going to be days that he's going to send you on a simple mission. And even though you have no evil in your heart, there will be those who plot to kill you at the sight of you just because. Trust me, if you plan on living for God, that means you're living for God in a world in which Satan at the moment is still alive. And there's nothing that Satan hates more than to see someone on mission for the Lord. So if you find yourself wondering why you are under attack all of a sudden, it's because attacking those who are about their father's business, as it were, is what the devil does. So Joseph in this narrative is simply going to check on his brothers. But when he goes to find his brothers, the Bible tells us a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? And he replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flocks? And the man said, they've moved on from here. 
Notice the difference between Joseph and his brothers. His brothers were not even where they were supposed to be. Had they been where they were supposed to be, Joseph would have found them. So the parallel is, here's Joseph doing what he had been commanded by his father, yet his brothers are on their way to Dothan, which their father did not tell them to go. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan, but they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, the Bible says, they plotted to kill him, saying, here comes that dreamer. Here comes that positive person. Here comes that uplifting person. Here comes that smiling person. Here comes that joyous person. Here comes that happy person. Here comes that person who's not bothering me, but because I'm having a bad day, I'm going to bother them. Here comes that Christian. Here comes that believer. Here, here comes that faithful person. There's something about goodness, unfortunately, that draws the deepest of evil out of evil people. And before Joseph can get to his brothers, it says, from a distance they saw him, and they plotted to kill him, saying, here comes that dreamer. They said to each other, come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. Because they knew what they were doing was wrong. They wanted to hide his body somewhere. A cistern. If you've ever read the book of Jeremiah, you've seen this word. You know that Jeremiah himself was once lowered into a cistern. Cisterns typically held water. Cisterns were places where animals went to get water. Cisterns were often dangerous places. They were often 10 feet deep. And here his brothers, his own brothers, are saying about their youngest brother, let's kill him and dispose of his body which now means they would also have to prepare a lie for their own father. At the sight of Joseph, they are ready to commit murder, lie about the murder, and to go on living their lives as if nothing happened, just because their brother had a dream. And they say, then we'll see what comes of his dreams. That was their desire, to kill their own brother. But when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands, saying, let's not take his life. Do not shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern in the desert. Don't lay a hand on him. The duality of this is the tribe of Reuben barely survived the destruction of 722 B.C. But there were some Reubenites who would have been alive when the book of Genesis was being edited and composed by priests like Ezra. So this is a reference to show that their ancestor was not quite as evil as the patriarchs of the other tribes. Reuben has a plan. He's not courageous enough to speak up for his brother and outright save his life, but he does want to, in a very beguiling move, to try to save his brother's life. What we see here, plain and simple, is that Joseph's brothers are setting him up because they hate him. Their hearts are filled with hatred and envy because instead of focusing on what they have, and they had some things, after all, all of them were patriarchs of what would become a great kingdom. All of them were the leaders of their tribes. All of them were the leaders of their families. All of them were descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But that was not good enough because their brother had something that they didn't have. The worst thing is, if they had just focused on the wealth that they had and the blessings that they had, they would have realized that to bless their brother would have also brought more blessings to them. This happens in life. You will have people who will see that someone has something that they don't have, and instead of figuring out how can I help them with their dream, understanding helping someone else is a way to be blessed ourselves. That we don't help someone strictly to be blessed, but at the same time, it's good to know that helping someone is a way to be blessed, as opposed to plotting against someone who is gifted in some way. Because all of us have a gift. And if we would ever view ourselves from the standpoint of all of us have a gift for which we could be hatred and, and hated and despised, then why hate anyone else for what they have? So the Bible says when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. See, they thought by taking away from him his clothing and his ornaments, by taking something physical away from him, they were hurting him. They don't understand that the robe was only to indicate who Joseph is on the inside. The robe did not make Joseph who he is. He was born with the gift. And no matter what physical thing someone has or does not have, it has nothing to do with the gift that is given. I say to young people so many times in a world of peer pressure, some young people are made fun of for the clothes they have or don't have, for the car that they have or don't have, 
for what they drive or don't drive. But what's most important is that God gives something that can't be bought. God gives something that can't be stolen. If we focus on the gift that we're given, we will find that no matter what the world tries to strip away and take away, the world can't take the gift that God gives. And so the Bible says when they stripped him of the richly ornamented robe, they took him and threw him into a pit. They threw him into a pit. We've all heard the story before, before, but verse 24 is profound, but often overlooked. Now the cistern, now the pit was empty. There was no water in it. The Bible stresses there was no water in it. This is a very direct reference to a number of things. You see, water was normally in the pit. Had there been water in the pit, Joseph would have drowned. Normally there would have been water in the pit. But if there's no water in the pit, it means that the pit is dry. It means that Joseph landed on dry ground. He landed in a place in which normally he would have drowned, but he landed in a place in which it was dry and he could live. But not only that, when there was not water in the pit, the pit often would have spikes in it because those pits were used as traps for wild animals. But there were no spikes in the pit. Not only were there no spikes or water in the pit, the pit was also used to trap wild animals that would try to attack a flock. But there was no wild animal in the pit. The pit was empty. It's a terrible thing to be thrown into a pit. But at the same time, this minor detail is not so minor when we realize it could have been and should have been a whole lot worse. That pit should have had water in it where Joseph would have drowned yet it was empty. That pit should have had spikes in it that would have impaled and killed Joseph, yet it was empty. That pit should have had a wild animal in it that would have eaten Joseph alive, yet the pit was empty. That pit easily could have been the last place on earth that Joseph would have ever been before being killed, and yet in a place that was meant for death, it was a place of a temporary holdup. Many times, beloved, we're going to fall in some deep pits in life. Many times, there are going to be people even that we love that will throw us in those pits. And for as bad as it is to be in a pit, for as bad as it is to be thrown down somewhere and put down, as bad as a pit could be, I thank God that if you're watching this message this morning, it means that your pit could have had some things in it that would have been the end of you. But your pit was empty. Yes, you were put down. And that pit could have been a whole lot worse. But at some point you got up and out of your pit. It's bad that you were put down there. But had you never been put down, you would never be able to appreciate the blessing of being able to get up. It's a bad thing to be put down in a pit. But thank God there was no water in our pit. Thank God there were no spikes in our pit. Thank God there were no wild animals in our pit. Thank God that the pit was empty when we were put down. It's easy to take for granted the fact that our pit could be a lot worse. It's easy to take for granted that as bad as things are right now, they could be a lot worse. But the thing is, if you overlook the blessing of being in a pit, a pit is the very thing that sets you up for what's coming later. We know how this story goes. We know that because Joseph was put there, that's what gets him in Egypt. Yes, he had to temporarily spend time in chains. He had to temporarily spend time in shackles. He had to temporarily spend some time in jail. But had he not been put in the pit to go through some things, he never would have become the governor of Egypt. It's easy to be mad about being in the pit because it's hard to see the throne that we sit on by way of the pit. But the only way to get to the throne is to go through the pit. The only way to get up it's by way of getting down. The only way to get to a point that you have your blessing is to go through something that's bad but could be a whole lot worse. The thing that is supposed to destroy us is the thing that deploys the blessing. The thing that is supposed to injure us 
It's the thing that engineers our greatness. The thing that is supposed to injure us the most is what energizes the anointing. The thing that should destroy us is the thing that will deploy us. Had Joseph never been put in the pit, Joseph never becomes governor. If Joseph is never betrayed, then Joseph never rules. If Joseph is never insulted and rejected and put down, he's never elevated, anointed, and lifted up. The only way to get there is by way of the pit. The pit is a bad place to be, but it is a necessity in order to have the fulfillment of what God has up ahead. In other words, God is saying the only way to overcome a thing is I got to take you through the thing. There's some things you have to go through. You can't go around it. You can't avoid it. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. Some things you just got to go through in order to get to where God is taking you. It's much like the longleaf pine tree. If you are around for watch night, regardless of any audio difficulties with Zoom in which you may have gotten some of it or may not have gotten some of it, I'm going to make sure now you get all of it. And if you weren't around for watch night, now we'll all be on one accord because every Christian should know about the longleaf pine tree. You see, the southeast cannot have wildfires. Wildfires happen on the west coast. You can't have wildfires in the southeast. Because the southeast has longleaf pine trees. Longleaf pine trees once occupied 90 million acres of what is now the southeast United States. You can only find longleaf pine trees in a few places. There are pine trees all over America, all over North America. There's only longleaf pine trees in the southeast. You can find them around the Mississippi Delta. You can find them around Alabama. You can find them in one part of Louisiana and only one part of Missouri. You can find them in the eastern part of Texas. You can find them east of Chattanooga in Tennessee. You can find them east of Frankfort, Kentucky. You can find them in a part of West Virginia. You can find them throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia and North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and the Florida Panhandle. That's the only part of the whole world where longleaf pines can grow. Because longleaf pines require a special soil because they have a special characteristic. They are fire resistant. Longleaf pine wood does not make for good firewood because it cannot burn up. It does not burn to ash. It can burn, it can get charred, but it won't burn to ash. In fact, longleaf pine trees need fire more than they need water. They die without fire. The only way to grow them is you have to burn them every year. You burn them at the trunk all the way up to the top. God made the longleaf pine grow 150 feet tall on average with an average age of 500 years. So it would grow tall enough to draw lightning so the lightning would strike the top of the pine tree and send the fire to the trunk. When the fire reaches the trunk of the tree, the nitrogen and the oxygen and hydrogen in the fire charges the soil around it and gives life to the entire forest. Fire burns up every other tree on earth. Fire burns up most things. Fire normally destroys. Fire normally kills. But the longleaf pine takes this very thing used for destruction and it is the means through which it becomes strong. If you want to be a Christian, if you want to know who Jesus is, if you want to understand God and God's relationship to the cross, you must understand that being a Christian means you take the things in the world that normally would destroy, and that's the thing that gives us life. You take the pit in which you're thrown, and that's how you end up sitting on the throne. You take the pain that you're given and turn that into power. Things that would burn up the rest of the world only serve to make us stronger. The rest of the world burns up. All we do is catch fire and take the fire and use it to give life. It's much like developing a vaccine where the thing that kills is the thing that heals. You see, the only way a vaccine can be issued is the creator of the vaccine must use it on himself or herself. This tradition goes all the way back to 1953 with Jonah Salk, 
When Jonah sought to develop the polio vaccine, he would not distribute the vaccine until he used it on himself and on his family. He knew that it worked because he used it on himself. And he held himself to the highest research standard because he would not give anyone else that which he would not give himself. Meaning even now with these vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna, the reason it takes so long is every developer must use it on themselves first. They cannot give the vaccine to any human until a human being who develops it uses it on themselves. When Jonah Salk gave himself the vaccine and saw that it worked, then the rest of the world got it. But what a vaccine is, it's a little part of the virus. It's a small part of the virus that replicates the virus. It's a little piece of that dangerous, lethal thing that the body takes in and transforms into proteins that are used to build up an immunity to the virus. Meaning the only way to stop a virus is you have to take a little bit of the thing that kills and you use that to grow it into something that allows life to go forward. In other words, just like the pit leads to greatness, just like that fire makes the longleaf pine strong, what the vaccination is, it's a little bit of death that's administered to a living body to create a whole lot of life. If you want to understand then why those who saw our Lord dying on a tree were saying to him, physician, heal thyself. They understood that Jesus could take death on the cross, which would destroy others. And Jesus said, being the salvific Christological longleaf pine tree, I'm going to take the fire of death that would destroy the world, and I'm going to transform it into something that will give life to the world. Jesus, being the perfect immun immunologist and virologist, said, I'm going to take this little bit of death and vaccinate myself with a little bit of it so I can inoculate the world with salvation. I'm going to take a little bit of this death and I'm going to use it to give life. If you want to understand what it means to follow Jesus, then you must understand from time to time you're going to have to deal with a little bit of some bad things. After you go through some things for a little while and that little while seems long I know and you have to be long suffering but after you go through it it's that little bit that you go through that allows you to enjoy a lot of the abundance that God has for you. When you understand that then you will know that when Jesus died on that cross and got up, he gave us the same thing that he had when he was on the cross. He gave us something. He put something in us that lets us walk through fire and not be burned. He put something in us that lets us walk through floodwaters but not be drowned. He put something in us that lets us stay warm on our coldest night. He put something in us that gives us the strength to go forward no matter how often we get put down. He put something in us that lets us stand on a rock in a weary land. He put something in us that lets us be able to go forward even when the devil's trying to push us back. He put something in us that lets us pray our way through a pandemic. He put something in us that let us worship our way through a hard time. He put something in us that lets us praise him even on a rainy day. He put something in us that lets us pray even when times get rough. He put something in us that keeps us up even when the world's trying to put us down. And he done just what he said. Didn't he do just what he said? Jesus done just what he said. He said he'd heal the sick. He said he'd raise the dead. Jesus done just what he said. He said he'd be a doctor for the rich and poor. He said he'd be a healer for the meek and low. And he done just what he said. He said he'd be a mother. He said he'd give the poor and needy bread. And he done just what he said. He said he'd be a teacher and teach the children right. He said he'd be a warrior and help the children fight. And he done just what he said. He said he'd be a burden bearer for a bad down head. And he done just what he said. He's still doing just what he said for the hardworking parent. He's still doing it for the job seeker. 
He's doing it for the entrepreneur. He's doing it for the teacher and the student. He's doing it for the discouraged and the disheartened. He's doing it for the prayer warriors. He's doing it for the worshiper. He's doing it for the faithful. He's doing it for the long suffering. He's doing it for the meek and lowly. He's doing it. He's got joy for the saints. He's got hope for all sinners. He's got salvation, anointing, inspiration, power, newness, all up ahead. And he done just what he said. And may all of God's people say amen. Amen. Amen.